Hey there, this is Douglas Blair from Wasp and Signal to Noise, and you are listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages-friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil and spot. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host Jeff Untied, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nuz. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, in downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Doug Blair of Wasp. Yeah, promoting Wasp's 40th anniversary tour, the European leg, yeah. coming up here this spring, correct? Yeah. And also promoting his project, Signal to Noise. Yeah, they got uh, some music out there to download, and you can. Uh, they got new music on the way. Yeah, what a phenomenal interview. Let's get to it. All right, good night. Good night. We would like to thank Douglas Blair for allowing us to use Signal to Noise music on this episode. Uh, we've replaced our normal bumper and ending tracks with songs from Signal to Noise. Check them out.
Doug, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unte. Doug, thanks for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Great to uh, meet you guys online here. Absolutely. So thank you for the correspondence, and thank you for your willingness to do this. We are so excited to have you tonight. I've never done a podcast, so I hope you don't... Uh... You know, run me over. Well, <laughs> you know, here it goes. So this is probably your first of many. We hope at least. Yeah. I hope so. I've done interviews, but I think the podcast thing is pretty, you know, it's it's exploding. It's getting a lot more popular, and I'd like to do more. So All right. thanks for having me. All right, let's do this, man. So you know, recently Wasp, I guess October through December, completed the first leg of the 34-date tour of the United States. Can you talk a little bit more about the uh, the planning portion of the tour and how it all came to fruition for you and Blackie and the rest of the band? Well, that we'd have to start back in the late 2000s because we had been playing consistently. I rejoined the band in 2006, and at that point, the live touring was kind of split half and a half mm-hmm. between Europe and America. And um, we have been releasing records since then. We released a record called Dominator in 2007, and a record called Babylon in 2009 and the difference is in Europe there's still a youth a younger market that listens to records that buys records that is interested in our new music so the market for our particular situation kind of took off in Europe way more than it did over here and by the end of the 2000s uh, the tours and the venues and the agents and the possibilities or whatever you want to kind of added all up to didn't live up to what we kind of were looking for so we kind of stopped playing in America. The last date we ever played in America was in at M3 Festival. I don't recall exactly what year but sometime around 2011, 2012, something there. Mm-hmm. And the last time we actually toured here was I think 2010 maybe 11. I don't recall. It seems like eons ago. I just don't even remember <laughs> when it was because it wasn't worth remembering unfortunately <laughs> uh one of the best memories i do have though when we used to play in america is we did play the alarosa not that it was the best memory but it was the most remarkable place to play there after the you know after the tragedy with dimebag but to stand in the exact position where he performed and mm. kind of we oh, all yeah. played the show yeah we all did it in a tribute to to him as every band did that went and played there after the the thing happened and the club did not close they they thought that dime would you know want it to stay open and want the bands to get up there and kick ass and that's what we did so that was a really re- re- memorable show of uh when we used to tour in america put it that way between 2006 and maybe 2010 so since then uh, we've been playing like hundreds of shows in Europe. I mm-hmm. I moved to Europe. I moved to Finland in 2014, and the scene there and the situation there is kind of a whole different ball game. It's not worth making a big giant comparison, but it's much younger. There are a lot of rock bands, new rock bands, and so we didn't really think about touring the states for quite a while. Um, we've been busy. Up until the pandemic, we've been quite busy doing uh, several tours over there. One for Golgotha was the last tour. uh, Well, no, it wasn't. 2015, we toured for Golgotha. In 2017, we toured for Reidolized. Mm -hmm. Then we did a few festivals, and then the pandemic hit. So the tour we're doing right now was originally scheduled for fall of 2020, and it would have been in Europe because we did not even have an agent that we trusted or wanted to work with at that point. Mm -hmm. But since that time, during the pandemic, uh, it came from a couple different angles, but it's funny because it came from an unexpected angle over in Finland. A a guy I know who I've worked with in different ways wrote and said, there's somebody that is interested in booking the band in America. I passed on that information, and it turned out that was a guy that the band had already been kind of looking at to work with. And it turned out this guy was great. It turned out this guy was finally an Asian we could trust to put together a great tour. And that's exactly what happened. And we're glad we waited so long because it would have been better than going out and trying to, uh, you know, scramble around and play rooms that weren't really the right rooms and, Mm -hmm. and just kind of play a show for the audience that wasn't quite the right show. So in, in a lot of ways, 
staying away from the states for that long of a time was a big asset, a big advantage, and we took the time to work in an environment where the bands are a lot younger, and they're all releasing records, and they're all touring for new records. There are a lot of legacy bands touring over there. There's Udo and Doro and mm -hmm. you know all those guys that are always playing, except... But it still is a different environment. They still are releasing new records and playing the new music on on their tours because the people want to hear the new songs. So being able to be in that environment, even though we had to travel abroad to play, still, I think, in the long run, put us in a really good position to be in great shape to come back here and do what we just did. If we had been only playing in America, it would be fly dates like everybody else does, playing on the weekends, you know, never any real tours. Mm -hmm. This band, since I've joined this band, the only, I mean, if you can call them fly dates, the only fly dates we've actually done were for festivals. We've never done the weekend, throw your pedal board in a bag and bring one guitar <laughs> on your back. Yeah. And, and, and it seems like that's the only way to play for most of our genre over here. So being able to keep on doing it the way we're used to doing it, which is, you know, blowing a bunch of money in the tour bus and having a real crew and putting together a real run that we can be our best and do, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 shows. Most of the runs were between 50 and 60 shows. So this U.S. one was actually a little bit of a shorter one for us, but we haven't toured in, in five years, so it was fine for it to be a little shorter. But the one coming up is 49 shows and it may get longer. So that's a little bit more of a normal run. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be in shape to do it. And we have been able to do those kind of runs. So uh, what happened then is that the agent was really, you know, everything clicked. They found great rooms. Nice. We hooked up with the Armored Saint, which has a lot of history with the band. It's interesting because Armored Saint had played with Wasp a long time ago in the 80s. Hmm. The band that I was playing with in New England at that point with Stet Howland, the drummer that ended up getting into yeah. Wasp and getting me into Wasp, that particular band, we were playing up in Vermont, and Armored Saint was playing with Quiet Riot, and they came over to the club where we were playing, and we all partied together all night. Oh, that's awesome. So we had our own interesting throwback kind of history with those guys when we met them again, and I said, you're not going to remember me. But we played, you know, we, we parted with you guys, and John the Singer got up on stage and sang Bang Your Head, you know, in the nightclub we were playing in. This had to be 1985, right about when they were playing with Wasp. But they were out on a short run with, with Quiet Riot or somebody else. I think it was Quiet Riot. So it's interesting that we met them back then as well. And to be on the run, uh, this run was a perfect blend to have those guys playing with us every single night. And we had Michael Shanker on several of the shows. That was an even added plus. So as far as waiting to do it right, that's really the definition. We really, it was worth waiting to get the right team together to play here because it's such a different environment here now. It's such, it's totally nostalgic. Unfortunately, nobody wants to hear any of our last four records or any of the songs from our last four records because they never heard them. Because they weren't, you know, re they weren't really released here. Mm -hmm. People could get them online and everything, but so that's a, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We get to do the nostalgia side over here, but I think in Europe we'll still be able to play our newer songs, and and people like all of the kind of the eras of the band. We have a lot, a lot of younger audience members over there, not coming with their parents, like the kids that come on their own. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. they, they all discover, it's kind of a really cool rite of passage in Europe for some reason, that they all discover on their own, one by one, they all discover Motorhead, Iron Maiden, Kiss, Wasp. Mm. They they discover them, and it's kind of like a ritual that they all have to go through it. Metallica, Slayer, all the classic bands, they, they all go through the phase of kind of wanting to see them and they don't only like the old stuff because they didn't grow up on the old stuff the way that people grew up on it here. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, you know what, yeah, so, what, what is amazing to me is that, you know, since Wasp had, hadn't toured the United States for such a long time. And then when you guys finally did this tour, 
over the October to December. Uh, man, the ticket, it was a hot commodity. I know when you guys came to uh, the Arcada in St. Charles, I was trying to get tickets for that thing. It was, they're, they're going for $300 a pop. I said, man, it out, it outpriced me, man, that's for sure. But um, I want to kind of move on to the, uh, the, the, uh, the Euro leg of the tour schematically. Uh, like you said, it was it's going to be forty nine stops, sixteen different countries. Um, yeah. How schematically was the tour designed? Did, uh, the, did the band and Blackie have any input, or was this strictly all, uh, you know, the, the tour management uh, having uh, the say so on where you're going to play it? I guess how does it all work on this end of things? Well, it's interesting because that's a good question. In America, most bands use a single agent to put together the whole tour because it's one country. So that's what we had lacked in the past is an agent that we could trust. And the band tried to work with several agents that all ended up being like borderline criminal. (laughs) And that's why we kind of bailed. And we finally found some guys that are really solid and really, and business is better now because the audience is older. They're going to spend more on tickets. The rooms are better. There's been a lot of nice rooms that have been renovated in the past 10 years that, that bands like ours can go in and play. A lot of that wasn't around 10 years ago. Mm. So the environment is different. But in Europe, every country pretty much has its own region. So we work with an agent. Well, we work with one agent that covers Scandinavia, for example. There's a Finnish agent that handles the Finnish shows, but he co-produces the shows with the Swedish agent who handles both Sweden and Norway and Finland. And then there's a German agent that handles Germany and Switzerland and Austria, for example. So there's many agencies in Europe, and that's why the environment has been more uh, lucrative and more productive as far as bands being able to continue to tour. Uh, The cities are a little closer together, so logistically it's a little less expensive to tour from city to city. You can play cities that are closer together because... The way that people stay in their own city zone is very different than America. America, people will drive pretty far, so you can't play cities that are too close to each other. Mm. So there's there's several aspects that make touring in Europe a whole different ballgame. There's language barriers. There are uh, currency and immigration, whatever you call it, um, uh, customs. Yes. Customs issues that you go over the border in Switzerland and they count every pick. <laughs> you know, they count every pick that I have because it could be sold. And then on the way out of Switzerland, they count every pick again to see that we, you know, showed all the numbers correctly. So there's a lot of that. Uh, uh, Russia, unfortunately, was a big, big market for us. It was actually our number one market. And unfortunately, we've lost that now. So we've lost a few shows in Russia. and uh, But when you say schematically, yes, it's many different agents. It all has to be kind of cobbled together, and it's a lot of work. Mm. And the tour that we're going to do coming up has been postponed twice. It originally yeah. was scheduled for the fall of 2020, and all the tickets were sold. Not all, but a bulk of the tickets were sold at that point, which puts us in an unfortunate situation with inflation and how much everything costs now and then it was postponed till last year 2022 and because of the lingering um differences between the covid requirements from country to country that's why we had to postpone it again Mm. we could have probably pulled it off but if we got to one country and one of the guys on the crew for example didn't have the right testing or the right whatever we might get in trouble so because the inconsistencies were still there. We had to postpone it again. So now the people are coming that bought tickets in 2020, almost three years ago, and and they're coming. And the sales were great. The sales were excellent because it was billed as a 40-year live tour, just like the one we just did in, in the States. And the, the sales are good, and the excitement is even higher now because of what just happened in America. So the audiences in Europe have seen all the videos, and they've seen the – new show and they've seen the stage set up so they're kind of they're excited about getting to see that and we've never been in that position before because we haven't flipped flop between 
America and Europe the way that we're doing right now. So it's kind of a pretty cool thing. We can play them against each other in a certain way that if we do real good in the States, it's going to help the the kind of anticipation and the sales over Europe. Then if we do real good in Europe, then that's going to turn around and help the sales for our next time we come play here. So it, it's, an, it's an interesting position to be in and not many American bands go over and tour in Europe the way we do. We're one of the few. Well, oh, very good. Yeah, Jeff. Got Can you ready? talk a little bit about your gear and uh, how many how many guitars do you take with you on tour? And and do you have a large guitar collection? Uh, I have a. I think I have about thirty, and they're all different types of guitars. So, uh, several double necks and several eight string basses and several are acoustic and several are uh, stage guitars for Wasp. So I think I have about ten or twelve guitars that would be considered like tour worthy to take out and i would love to take more but we're uh democratic yeah. put it that way we're a democratic <laughs> band we have one guitar tech and of course you know hiring and paying good good technicians is is not cheap and it's important that we have good technicians and take care of them well and pay them well so my inclination to bring five or six guitars is kiboshed it's yeah. kiboshed rather quickly i get they want me to bring two because everybody else has two but i always bring a third just in case they get lost on the plane that's my excuse yeah <laughs> so i have a, i have a big double case that carries two guitars and my excuse is well what if that case gets lost i have no guitar so i carry a third as sort of an odd guitar in case there was a problem with one of the two or whatever so yeah, I only get to bring three, and that's worked out fine. I mean, we we rip between songs. There's no time, you know, to be switching all the time. And the other guys pretty much get through their set with one guitar all night and pretty much have the, the, the other guitar as just a backup. So, I mean, it would be great to be Frank Hannon and have, you know, three <laughs> vaults with 29 guitars and get to play a different guitar every song. That would be wonderful. But, you know, we, we want to be able to afford to tour in Europe, the thing I, was, I, I forgot to say is like gasoline is three times as expensive as it was last yeah. time we toured. Oh, yeah. And so is the tour bus. So when you go and look at those numbers, it's kind of like, well, it, you know, it's not going to be as easy as it was before. We're going to have to go just do it and and enjoy it because not many, a lot of other bands are actually deciding not to tour right now because of how expensive it is. Mm. So we'll go there and just rip it up. Absolutely. So, you know, with Wasp having the abundance of material albums throughout the years, uh, putting a set list together, I guess, would be different uh, putting a set list for a U.S. tour opposed to a European tour set list. Can you kind of break down the uh, the process of narrowing the songs down of what era of Wasp? and How, how does it work? From the U.S. set list to the Euro set list? I think that the only real difference between the two would be the last four records. Hmm. And because there's been a good visibility and some airplay and some sales of the last four records in Europe, then we would tend to include some of those songs, like a song called Heaven's Hung in Black or uh, Take Me Up is a good one. Crazy is one that was sort of kind of a little hit on the radio over there. And the audiences all know it, so we put it in the set, and, and it it keeps up with all the other ones. The criteria that we use to make our set is that the set is only as strong as the weakest song. Yeah. So any song you try to put in there, it's got to hold up to the other songs. We don't want to have any lulls, or any parts of the show where where a song is just not working. So no matter how much we love a song or want it, add a song to the set that the fans love, we, it has to work. It has to really be able to pull its weight. So we've tried out a lot of different songs over the years, and some of them just quite don't come across for some reason or another, and we try them later. Sometimes they come around and, and turn into a song that we can you know, take out on the road and it kicks ass live, but sometimes they don't. So the set is built of what really works song by song and the long kind of the, the overall pacing of the whole set that at the end of the show 
you're trying to you know you're trying to rile the crowd up into a frenzy and the set list we had for the US run did that and we're trying to figure out why <laughs> we don't know exactly why but we have a feeling that it has to do with you know us being away for a long time and also adding the song animal mm -hmm. which we hadn't played I've never played it in the band I think I rehearsed it once uh, maybe we did a sound check, but we never added it until this tour. And I love the song, but it didn't seem to fit in the previous tours and sets and just the way that the the direction was going with presenting new material. It just didn't seem to fit in. But with this particular run and playing for the American fans that hadn't seen the band and didn't know that much of the newer material, then it worked great. And the presentation about the PMRC was a great addition because a lot of people remember that. Yeah. The people that come to see us here in the States all kind of grew up with the band. They remember that period when, yes. you know, Judas Priest and everybody was in there doing it. Again, taking that, I mean, we, we will play Animal in Europe, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know how many of the people are as familiar with that particular issue. And if they're not, then they could find out about it because it was a very important issue censorship which is still very important everywhere so it, it it's still certainly pertinent even if people in Europe weren't watching MTV and weren't alive when that song was you know when the band was getting hauled in to court for, yes. you know, or, yeah. or being put on the list so even if they don't have a personal connection with it the way that a lot of the fans here in the States did I think it's still going to come across as a pretty strong statement against censorship and being able to play that damn song if we want to. So it's, it's really cool to add that one. Um, and we hadn't played a song called The Flame ever before. And a few other ones had been sort of re, repositioned and reimagined. So it's an ongoing process and we'll probably tweak some things for Europe. And then we'll, you know, look at it when we come back here. Well, fantastic. Well, let's switch gears on you here. Let's talk a little bit about okay. sig Signal to Noise. Yeah. Is a project that you started working on what back in 1995, I believe it was. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I was in the band from 1992 to about 1994, and I went and did the Crimson Auto record uh, tour, not the record. I did the tour, and that was fucking awesome. And it changed everything. It changed my whole perspective and my whole outlook towards what we were doing, and and it was just an unbelievable stroke of luck to get to do that, even if it didn't last forever. And I actually honestly believe that I would never be in that situation again. So after we finished that, uh, I started a guitar company building double neck guitars, and then I got into uh, mixing sound for a life for a job, and then I worked at a, a guitar company. Mm -hmm. But along the way, the band that I had been in before I got into Wasp sort of morphed into a trio that I wanted to uh, kind of showcase the double neck guitars I was using. And I wanted my bass player to be able to play guitar notes behind me. We already had MIDI synthesizer pedals for a long, long time, like Rush. Mm -hmm. So we already had synthesizer sounds in our trio. So we didn't sound empty. When I played a lead, we could have some good keyboard sounds or whatever. But I was influenced by this band called Filter. And Filter had yeah. just... Often they just had two guitars going yang, 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 yang together. <laughs> and I heard that and I'm like, okay, we're a trio, but I want to be able to do that. So I first just said, okay, I'm going to stick a couple guitar strings. Actually, it started with one guitar string. I'm going to stick one guitar string on my bass player's bass. I'm going to put it right next to his bottom bass string. And it can push him down with one finger, just like a 12-string a guitar. Totally easy. So I stuck one string on there and put a little pickup on it and we stick that it, we put that into a Marshall amp and it worked and it worked really cool. He was able to go yin, 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 <laughs> and I was able to play a little bit. So that's where it started. It was just an experiment. And then I said, okay, I'm going to give him, you know, four guitar strings with his four bass strings and see where it goes. But then I moved up to Boston and I got up there and I could not find a bass player. I found a drummer. And I'm thinking, okay, if I want to find a bass player and keep the band going, find you know, put together a band up here, i got to find a bass player. And then one day I just said, fuck it, I'm going to try to play that thing 
and play it with just my drummer, just a drummer. And that's where it started. And it's been really, really fun. That's and it's cool. been extra, extra super great for not only the reason of developing that instrument, but here's, here's the good part that came about later is that I stopped playing lead guitar for years. I, yeah. I taught guitar. I taught my students, but I didn't play lead guitar in any band. I focused only on that instrument. And it was great because I focused on singing and I focused on writing some riffs and whatever. But here's the reason that it turned out to be a really great blessing in disguise is when the turnover happened in Wasp, when Daryl got kicked out and Stett left the band, and I heard through the grapevine that Daryl had gotten kicked out. When that happened, and I was asked to come out and cover a few shows, because mm. that's all it started with in 2006, when I got there, I hadn't even played lead guitar in like five or six years. Not, I mean, oh. I did some things, but I hadn't thought about it, I hadn't focused on it, I hadn't been noodling Ingve Malmsteen arpeggios for, for five years straight. Mm. You know, I hadn't been doing any of that uh, trying to, like, get better as a lead guitar noodler kind of shit. So what happened when we went to record Dominator, I was able to kind of start from scratch and really just play what what I naturally could play on the guitar. And I, I look back on that now, and that was a real blessing in disguise. Because if I had been playing lead guitar that whole time, what I ended up playing on Dominator would sound completely different because I would have been mm. practicing all the time and becoming whatever that guitar player would have been. So coming in to record Dominator 2007, it was sort of really fresh again. It was really fun to go back and, and become lead guitarist again and play lead guitar with Blackie's voice. And that's all it's been since then. Oh, so cool. That's my job, and I love it. And I, I sort of compare it to Neil Sean and Steve Perry, who are like my heroes. Neil Sean plays around Steve Perry's voice so fucking awesome. And one of the things that I think lead guitarists had never done with Blackie was to be able to play with him and around him. Yeah. Chris's leads and Randy's leads, they always played right in the lead spot, and it's great. There's There's tons of great leads. Every one of them, you know, Wild Child and Love Machine, mm -hmm. they're all awesome leads. But they didn't, like, engage Blackie's voice and intertwine with his voice. And that's what I think we've been able to achieve on the last four records since I got back in the band, is I've been able to find a style that kind of kind of links in with his style. And it's really fun to do that. Well, you know, and, um, to, to capitalize off that in, in the evolution of you as as the lead guitarist and going from Signal Noise back to Wasp and and, and so forth, um, and taking over lead vocals at, at Signal to Noise, I guess in in this part of your career, how do you view yourself? Do you still view yourself as the the lead guitarist that sings, or do you also view yourself as the lead singer that also plays guitar? How does it work for you? Well, in Wasp, I'm the lead guitarist that sings backup, and yeah. that's what I yeah. Yeah. do, and that's what I love to do, and rhythm guitar, but my main thing is to, to, when he's not singing, I'm in there playing lead, like the guy in Brian Adams. I love the lead guitarist for Brian Adams. Brian sings all his shit, and then you have this great lead <laughs> yeah. guitar that's always there. And uh, then the other side of the coin is with Signal to Noise, I get to approach it more as a songwriter. Most of the stuff that we play with Signal to Noise is written on an acoustic guitar and can be played just on an acoustic guitar. So oh, it's almost yeah. like sitting there with an acoustic and trying to write verses and chord progressions and choruses and riffs and stuff that work on one instrument, that you don't need a bass player playing a separate bass line that's totally different than the guitar part. So that's where it relates more to being sort of a singer-songwriter, where you're just sitting there with your acoustic guitar. Mm. So that's been really great. And again, when I'm not playing with Blackie in Wasp, I'm not running to the first band, you know, to go play at the Whiskey and, and <laughs> do the same thing with other bands. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to play lead guitar with any other band ever. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe with Steven Wilson. Maybe with my hero Steven Wilson. That would be the only 
the only guy I'd like to play lead guitar with. But that's what I mean. I want to save it all to play with Wasp. And other than that, I'd rather fight with this giant H string and try to create a style that is really unique and even more so find some younger players that will take the thing and, and do something even cooler with it. Oh, oh yeah, that's fantastic. Awesome. Did, did you have any reservations of uh, picking up the mic and singing, or is that something that you just always um, enjoy dabbling with? Absolutely. With Run 21, I used to sing okay. many songs lead. Maybe not half of them, but I would say I sung one-third of the songs lead vocal, and then Stet, the drummer, he used to sing probably one-third of the songs. Not the original songs, but before we went all original, we were playing covers in the clubs, yeah. and Stet would sing... He would sing the cover songs, standing up with his, you know, playing, standing up, holding the microphone, singing, bang your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the bass player, he sang most of the lead. And, and we went, when we went all original, he sang most of the songs because he wrote them. But for Signal to Noise, since I write them, and the drummer I was working with in Boston, he also wrote, then we both sang lead vocal. And I love it. I nice. don't think I have the best voice in the world, but I think... I, I have a, a good delivery and that's what's it's just like playing lead guitar you need to find your style of how you deliver your vocal you don't have to have you know Blackie's got an unbelievably unique and, and ridiculously char character, characteristic voice and so does a guy like Brian Adams but there are still plenty of singers that don't have quite that char characteristic of a voice but still can deliver a song you know, that pummels you into the ground, that melts you into the ground. Mm. It isn't completely necessary to have, you know, a crazy voice to sing a great song and deliver a great vocal. So it's really enjoyable. And, and with Signal to Noise, it's also designed as a, as a vehicle for, for a lot of guest musicians, either oh, yeah. vocalists or other people. So, uh, you know, it's great to have other people come in and sing a song here and there or I do a duet with this one or with that one. So I'm not trying to, like, you know, dominate the whole thing and make it only about my voice. It's really about whether we can write good songs and create a really cool band with just the two of us and just have a different way of having a band. That's all. I was in a trio forever, and now uh, Wasp is a quartet, and then Signal to Noise is a duo. So it's all... It's all good. It's just a different way of slicing up the pie. Yeah. Very cool. Are you guys working on any new material? Absolutely. That's why I'm out here. We're, <laughs> do you mean Wasp or Signal to Noise? Well, e either one. Well, I'm in Wasp mode fully when I'm here in America. So once I get back over to Finland after our tour is done, then we're going to get back into Signal to Noise mode and probably play yeah. some festivals and try to do some shows. But there isn't much of a window this year, we'll be back. I'll have to be back out here to record what will become the next Wasp record. So yes, I've been out here writing almost every night with the guys, oh, very, and it's great. Very good. Uh, let me let me just summarize how we do it. We go so old school that we might as well be in like seventh grade. <laughs> so we we go we go get a blaster, yeah, to to record because of the good condenser microphone. Uh, there's ideas on music discs. There's basic ideas of melodies and, and chord progressions on music discs. But we sit together. We work up the drum beat. Uh, Mike works up the bass line. We work up the two guitar parts. Just, you know, not really fully developed, but just getting them in the ballpark. And we work on the arrangement. So we have a song that starts and ends and makes us all excited. But we're sitting there in a garage in chairs playing it you know, three, 20 decibels. That'd be fun. <laughs> so it's so, you know, it's so un, unlike what you'd think, yeah. we'd, you know, you'd think be, we'd be all plugged into all our gear in a big studio. Now, the best way to really be in creative mode is totally to strip away all the other crap and just sit there. I mean, we could do it acoustic, but we do have our electric guitars and little amps and, and the drum machine, and we just basically sit and talk and talk about the ideas and try out different things. So that's what we've been doing. We've got, I think, six songs done and, nice. and a whole, you know, a big whiteboard with eight more or something on it. So that's the that's the process that, that we go through. And I got to go up there now and, you know, 
work for five hours and see where we see what we get done. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Uh, Signal to Noise did release a five-song EP back in September, correct? Yes, that's a. We have a nine-song full length, but. We've been trying to figure out the best way to leak this out and just kind of okay. let people know that, that there's a cool project that I'm doing when I'm not playing with Wasp. So, again, during the pandemic, nothing happened. And now, thankfully, things are getting back in gear and things are kind of filling up the calendar. So we've been trying to figure out what to do with Signal to Noise to release a single here, then make a video, and then release a little bit later on. Uh, and that's that's where the idea for the five song EP came about to get something out that's sort of a a little smaller of a taste, but a representative taste of what we can do. We've got maybe 12 more songs, and I think the first full length will be nine songs, and then I have another one that would be ready after that. But again, if we're touring all the time with Wasp and putting out a new Wasp record. I've got to figure out the right way to time mm-hmm. yeah, what to yeah. do with, with signal to noise. And I'm just hoping that down the road there will be a little more time to get back into it. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not a spring a young spring chicken. <laughs> so you never know. You just uh, but I look at my contemporaries like Guthrie Govan and the Aristocrats is a good example and uh, Alex Skolnick is a great mm-hmm. uh, inspiration to me that he does Testament, and he's got his, his trio, the Alex Golden Trio, who, who I've seen in Boston. And it's just great that he can keep that many balls in the air at the same time. I know it's hard to. So I'm just, you know, trying to keep keep things rolling. And the signal to noise material is very interesting, and I hope I can get it out someday and let, you know, let people hear it. And I really hope we can get on the road someday and let people see how, how cool the thing is live because we don't use any click track no backing tracks no nothing we play songs uh frontwards backwards we can switch into any song we want it's it's totally you know it's off the cuff two people playing together and that's that's what we've always wanted it to be and it's a lot of fun and you know if if it gets a chance to get out in europe someday that would be great oh so, oh, so exciting well the big question here that we've been waiting to ask you is, uh, can you talk a little bit more about your contributions, uh, you, uh, yourself, and Bruce Kulik's co- contributions to uh, Dreams in the Witch House? Well, that's an awesome project that uh, a couple of guys put together, one from Stockholm, Sweden, named uh, Ufa Larsen, and his stage name is Chris Laney, and he has worked with... Uh, uh, who did he work with? He had a band called Animal with, uh, with uh, what's his name? Now I'm drawing a blank. Chris Holmes and the other guitar player that Chris played with. Uh, now I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, he's a producer from Stockholm, and then there's a guy from Los Angeles that thought this thing up, and they started it in about 2012. And I met these guys in 2013 and contributed leads to maybe six or seven songs on the the first full length release which came out in 2013 but since then because they're trying to make it into a movie they need 85 minutes of music so they've been releasing additional kind of eps and and releases and i've gotten to do i think three or four or even more and even was able to record a song i wrote back in the day with ron 21 and bruce kulik lent us his bass and then uh that was so bruce is on a lot of the dreams and witch house songs as well he plays a lot of really cool lead and he plays lead acoustic on a couple of the songs so bruce is one of the many guys that they've reeled in they had mickey d play drums on one of the songs Mm. a lot of a lot of different guys came in and contributed parts and that's a really cool uh off the side type of direction i mean it's metal so it's right up my alley lots of different singers and lots of operatic type of singing so oh, yeah, it was cool. really fun to be involved in that but the main thing is i met so many people through all those guys because it's a big web in sweden uh rock and metal and everything is really healthy and alive over there so there's lots of bands and producers and they all know each other and they all kind of work together and support each other there isn't a lot of competition where they're all kind of like ah 
fuck that guy. I'm not going to help him. <laughs> There's a lot of real good collaboration. So you meet one guy, and before you know it, you know 20 more guys. So that was really fortunate to get involved with the Dreams in the Witch House. And the producers of that project even helped me remix an old Christmas song that I did in 1988. Mm. And we had had Bruce Kulik come in and play a a beautiful acoustic lead over the track that I had recorded back in 1988. And, And that came out in 2018. So that's something I don't know if I had mentioned on the long summary I sent you guys. But the, the bottom line is, by you know, you said he, it's a lot of material. I sent you a plethora. The bottom line is, if I hadn't moved over to Europe, I don't think I would have done much of any of that. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a critique on the scene here. It's actually, that's how America works. America moves... It doesn't stay the same, and that's why big band died and, and rock and roll took over, and that's why maybe someday rock and roll will die and whatever else will be the next thing will take over. That happens in America because we pioneer kind of the next music usually that the rest of the markets kind of follow, including Europe. So Stockholm right now is probably the, the closest thing to 1980s Sunset Strip that you're going to find. Everybody dresses like that. The music is like there's a lot of great retro bands in Sweden, like Heat, like the guy that joined Skid Row. He came from a band called Heat. There's a lot of great bands like that that almost could have been on the strip in the 80s. And that's all good and fine, and it also has a lot to do with why we have a great audience in Europe. But America moves on. So if I had stayed in, in America and didn't move to Europe, I don't think I would have been able to take advantage of a lot of these really cool things I've been able to in the last 10 years. So by moving over there, it's been cool to meet these people. It's been cool to to get involved in the Dreams in the Witch House. And even more so, that Wasp, without even knowing it, we didn't even realize this until we did the U.S. tour, that being not stuck, but deciding to play in Europe for that whole decade and being used to playing up against Volbeat and whoever, uh, Gijora, mm-hmm. whoever the other bands that we're always playing with at these festivals and who was touring when we're touring, that's actually been a really big plus to kind of keep ourselves surrounded by younger and more kind of vital bands that are really still kicking ass and not sort of getting into the nostalgia territory so that's, I think that's kept us in really good shape. So we're looking forward to getting back to Europe and, and having to, you know, up the game and make sure that we can keep up with those guys. <laughs> well, we are so excited to yeah. hear that there's new Wasp material, material on the horizon, but we're out of our allotted time for the evening. But um, okay. uh, I have one last question for you, and then we'll leave you alone because sure. we know you have a long night of songwriting. <laughs> um, yes, we'll, we'll get the pedal to the metal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, the mystery of rock and roll, uh, the dawning of the internet, social media has taken that mystery of rock and roll. We no longer have bands like Zeppelin or Kiss anymore, or even a Wasp, because social media has kind of taken that away from rock and roll. But you, as the artist and the fan, what do you like more? Do you like the accessibility of the social media? Because if we didn't have social media... We wouldn't be doing this with you right now and the internet. Or do you miss that mystique and the mystery of rock and roll? It's a good question, really good question. I would lean more on the, the latter because I'm not a big internet time spender, put it that way. Mm-hmm. I know it's there, and I know I can go dig in when I need to find something or want to find something. But I do prefer to find out on my own. I do prefer to leave things to the imagination or to discover later on your own. So uh, to use a good example, my hero is this guy, Stephen Wilson, who played with uh, Porcupine Tree. Yes. And, and he's a guy that has discussed that very issue at length. I mean, it, ad nauseum. Not in a bad way, but he's constantly under pressure to show more and to, you know, to go that route, whereas he firmly believes, like we do, 
that you want to try to maintain a certain level of mystique and keep a certain level of of mystery and not let everybody know exactly what's going on all the time. So it's it's got to just be a balance, and the balance is, you know, every band has their own balance. Some bands throw every single thing they ever do online, yes. and their fans eat it up. And whether it gets them anywhere in the long, long term, it's hard to tell. Uh, I will make this point that one of the uh, Blackie finally did meet and greets, but he did it in a really interesting way that I don't think many bands do, which he, which is he let the fans that came to the meet and greets actually interview him, just like you are right now. Oh, nice. They all got a question, and whether the answer took 20 minutes or five minutes, they all got their answer. And what what I firmly believe is that Blackie's lyrics connect to each listener in a way that if they knew so much about if they knew too much about Blackie personally, they wouldn't be able to make their own connection with each one of those lyrics. The the way that he's protected his mystique and kept kept himself private in comparison to so many other artists and performers, I think that's part of the key that each listener can really relate to his lyrics in their own way. And when he did the meet and greets, he got to hear that firsthand. He got to hear the people tell him what his lyrics mean, meant to them, one at a time, each one completely personal. And, of course, they would ask Blackie, they would say, well, what did, what did it mean to you? And it, even if Blackie told them at that point, they had never known that until then. So they were able to able to fully develop their own their own interaction and their own interpretation of the lyrics and the songs because Blackie keeps himself private. Now my hero Stephen Wilson the same way. He 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 talks sometimes, but as far as the music, it's whatever you want to make of it. He doesn't you know, he doesn't over he doesn't overdo it he keeps he keeps a, a very good level of mystery and only lets out maybe technical stuff you know everybody wants to know how he produces and this and that and how they get the sound but as far as the personal stuff he's pretty private mm. and uh, and it just makes people want to know more about him it just increases the hunger so I I believe you know I can't speak for the other guys but I think we're all on the notion leaning more in the direction that if you keep yourself out of the spotlight as much as you can, then they're wanting more and more to find out what the hell's going on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, right. So if you, if you spread everything out and throw it all out there, they go, Oh, great. I know everything that's going on. And then they probably lose interest. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, that's, that's my take on it. Yeah, very good. Um, before we let you go for the evening, uh, is there anything that we left off tonight that you would like to plug or promote? I oh, don't know. We covered the signal to noise. We covered the tours. Uh, we covered the dreams in the witch house. And uh, I, I work for a really cool band coaching program in Finland. And I can't, you know, spend a lot of time talking about it. But what I was talking about before where the young people discover the music on their own, that's what I really find when we go and, and work with these young bands over there. Nice. Is I'll be practicing in one room, practicing my stuff by myself, and I'll stop playing between songs, and I'll hear some kid playing Love Gun. I'll hear the riff to Love Gun in a little room, or I'll hear Wild Child, and I'll put my guitar down, and I'll go running out the door and down the hall and go to the door where that kid is playing, and I'll open up the door, and it's like a 13-year-old kid. And I open up the door, and I'm like, how do you know Love Gun? <laughs> he goes, oh, I, I love Kiss, and I love Megadeth and Metallica. And then I go, because your parents love it? And he's, no, 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 I love it. My friends are all into, you know, Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath. And I'm like, dude, you're 13. <laughs> you're growing up on exactly, they're growing up on exactly what I grew up yeah. on in the mm -hmm. 1970s. That's what blows me away. And, um, you know, there'll be a kid playing Wild Child, and I'll open up the door and go, you're playing fucking Wild Child. He's like, yeah, I love that song. And I'm like, 
are you playing it right? <laughs> so, so it's a different it's a different environment. And I'm, you know, I know there's a lot of kids here that play guitar, and there's a good. I think Guitar Center has started teaching lessons at their stores, which is a really good thing. That to get kids in to learn privately instead of just watching the internet, just sitting with their computer and trying to learn off the internet. I don't think that it's ever going to go away. But the band coaching program in Finland, I've been able to basically feel like I'm a teenager again vicariously by working with these kids because they work hard they're they want to get signed they want to write good music they're you know working on their websites and their their social media presence and they're making their backdrops and they're recording their songs and and it's really exciting to be involved in it totally separate from wasp even though I'm doing those same things with wasp here I am getting to do that with young bands in a program that, that kind of encourages it. So that's been a, a, a really big plus over the past 10 years. We didn't talk about that that much. So I wanted, just wanted to mention that. Yeah. And I know that occurs in different places. It's not only over there. But it's really cool when it does occur because those are the kids that are going to make the next you know good band. Yeah, and, that's exciting to hear. So, you know, the next band... Whoever's going to be the ones that become the next Metallica, you know, they're they're 12 years old right now, or 14, or whatever. Oh, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Well, this is how it's going to work out. Uh, we're a few weeks behind on our, our our episodes, but Jeff, the editing wizard here, will get this out, and we'll make sure we get this out before you head on the European portion of the WAPS tour. Sound good? That'll be totally awesome, guys. Sorry I talked your ears off. No, man, we, <laughs> no, we are great. so excited to have you tonight. This yeah. has been fantastic. And, uh, man, safe travels over in Europe. All right. Thank right, you man. very much. Have a good night, you guys. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Floor.